So, good afternoon and welcome back again to the uh, panel session uh, in our conference missions for sustainability. Um, for those who haven't been here uh, before, who just joined uh, perhaps, uh, I would like to just briefly outline the main topic that we would like to discuss here uh, today, because of course there's a broader one, which is the overall conference theme, but um, between today and, and tomorrow we had to divide a little bit. So today, of course, we would like to, to focus on, on the core challenge uh, that results from confronting the mission approach with sustainability transformations on the one hand side and what that implies. Uh, so. We have on the one hand side the missions approach which uh, aims to tackle grant challenges through broad research and innovation policy programs focusing on, on achieving ambitious goals within a limited time frame uh, with limited resources uh, of course th which is a proven approach in a way but um, uh, and therefore also widely uh, replicated across the globe however um, on, the, on the other hand, um, it is of course not that clear how uh, mission, the mission approach can be used for uh, actually achieving sustainability transformations. Um, there is uh, obviously linked to this challenge uh, the, um, the question of how to address rather difficult choices because uh, transformation means that you need to topple the status quo uh, and that comes of course with major social and political conflicts. Um, questions about equity, justice, responsibility, redistribution, sufficiency uh, need to be answered. Uh, and these are not necessarily innovation questions, um, but questions of social change. On the other hand, we have the current research innovation systems and also science system, um, which were uh, conceived for rather other purposes and not necessarily for addressing global sustainability transformations and um, related conflicts, um, but rather maybe, uh, especially when we think about research innovation, about system optimization. Um, so in, in a word, we could state um, that the dilemma may be that on the one hand side, we have a, an, an ideal type approach for making big innovation steps, but its actual ability to deal with sustainability transformation, which is of course the big step in question, seems rather unclear, uh, if not even undermined. So we would like to talk a little bit about what can this mission approach contribute to achieving sustainability and that's a question uh, I'd like to discuss today here with um, our invited guests uh, that I'd like to briefly introduce. So we have um, our keynote speaker of course with us, uh, Dr. Lea Fünfschilling. She's an associate senior lecturer at the Center of Innovation Research uh, at Lund University, Sweden and her research deals with the dynamics of sustainability transitions in various industries and uh, she's especially interested of course in understanding transitions as deinstitutionalization processes and also the role of transformative innovation policies. So welcome Lea von Schilling again. Um, we also have with us here today uh, Dr. Dietrich Nelle. He is a deputy head of the Department for Policy Issues and Strategies at the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany since October 2018. Um, and he was intensively involved in transformation processes in Germany, Europe and Central Asia in various positions at state and federal levels as well as abroad since uh, 1983. Most recently, uh, he headed the subdepartment science organizations as well as the subdepartment innovations in the service of society, dealing with topics such as IT security, communication systems, security research, electronic systems, electromobility, and human technology interaction. So, welcome, Dr. Delle. Also with us here in presence, uh, Professor Uwe Kantner on our. Uh, uh, on the other end here of the spectrum of the, of the panel. He holds the Chair of Economics and Microeconomics at the Friedrich Schiller University Jena, Germany, uh, and is also the Chair of the Commission of Experts for Research and Innovation of the German Federal Government since May 2019, uh, of which he's a member since 2015. His research focuses on innovation economics, uh, entrepreneurship and startup research, cluster, network and transfer research, industrial dynamics, research and innovation policy, as well as radical and transformative change. So welcome, Uwe Kandner. And we also have with us online, uh, here on the screen next to me, 
um, Professor Rainer Walz. Uh, he is the head of the Competence Center Sustainability and Infrastructure Systems and deputy of the Fraunhofer Institute of Systems Innovation Research in Karlsruhe, Germany. Um, and his research deals with sustainability innovation, environmental and natural resource policy, impacts of new technologies, as well as interactions between economic development, globalization, and the environment. So welcome, Professor Walz. Yeah, to start, um, I think I would like to uh, ask perhaps Lea uh, von uh, You, in your keynote, you were talking about the necessity um, that if you are, would like to transform systems, you of course need to break something down. Something has to disappear, something has to vanish. And how far do you think that missions could contribute to such endings? So bringing systems uh, to a um, breakdown perhaps, or fade out, phase out, you know? What, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what role do you see for missions in that? Yeah, I would say that um, it depends how they're designed. So if you design it in a way where you not only focus on where you want to go, but also explicitly address what needs to be dismantled, rethought, reorganized, then that's, that's very much a possibility. Um, in the current mission statements, I see a lot of visions about, you know, the next generation of reality we would like to have and not so much a concretely assessed, you know, statement over what would then logically have to go or be changed drastically. Um, and I think there's several reasons for that, among others that we, especially in the Western culture, are absolutely not used to dealing with endings. In general, we don't have many institutions that are enabling us to have a process of endings. We have a few like divorce, bankruptcy procedures, maybe assisted suicide, but we don't really like to talk about how things end. We barely know how to end relationships in private or also in a, in a more uh, public sector. So I think that's something we have to start addressing. If we want to go somewhere else, what happens with the things that we do have? How are we leaving things behind? And I think a mission should include a clear idea of how to end what needs to go. So yes, I hope so. Yeah, so we, I guess that's the point we will definitely come back to in terms of what that implies for the design of missions, therefore, yeah, if this is actually a, a key requirement. Uh, yeah, Dietrich Nelle, um, the federal government has in its coalition agreement clearly stated that uh, there is a need to reinforce and strengthen mission-oriented research and innovation, building of course on existing uh, approaches and programs, um, but also thinking and uh, um, stating about uh, this extension or uh, reinforcement. Uh, what would be the plans for that and where do you see uh, the mission-oriented approach in future research policy here in Germany? Yes, um, the mission-oriented approach was something new we introduced four years ago and um, deliberately uh, we cho chose to have 12 completely different approaches. It was sort uh, of an experimental enterprise to look at different approaches to see what can work, uh, what leads to progress, and uh, what um, needs to be done differently. And uh, we have taken a number of lessons learned. Um, and we are not yet there at the end. We are getting also help, uh, for instance, from EFI. I think Professor Kantner um, will explain more on that. We also had an advisory body for the strategy uh, composed of uh, people coming from science, coming from different enterprise uh, sectors, from civil society, uh, who also had a look uh, on the system uh, like it was. And um, there they pointed to a number of improvements. Um, of course, uh, very important uh, is the step of formulating uh, the, the missions. Um, you need to be careful uh, to, to set the beginning right. 
um, if you are not clear enough, uh, you will lose a lot of time afterwards. Um, this is uh, certainly one lesson that some of our missions we had to find were by far too vague. Um, a second point is um, we defined the missions, but we didn't really define at the beginning support structures. So we had one example that was cancer research where uh, they chose to start very early implementing a um, support structure. And I think this was also one reason why that mission was the most successful one. So we concluded uh, we, we already had discussions in the ministry how to deal with the five EU missions. And so one element was uh, for our contributions to those EU mission, uh, we need support structures. This is something we put into place. And then, of course, um, it's always an issue, um, cooperation between ministries. Uh, they are having different cultures. Um, they have a different focus on different issues. Uh, they are not always uh, politically uh, on the same line, but very often they are somehow also political competitors. Um, I think uh, in this respect, uh, in the last uh, period, we did make quite some headways. We had uh, a council of state secretaries, or the state secretaries uh, from ministries concerned uh, with innovation. Uh, it was not a decision-making body, but it was a very useful body for exchanging about views, problems, uh, without the need to, to quarrel about a certain issue, but rather to look forward uh, what we can do. And also, again, coming back to the EU mission, uh, I think we have made, uh, found a quite a good solution of combining uh, for the EU missions always a cooperation from the research ministry and, and the most concerned line ministry. Yeah. So I think those are some of the important points we need to develop further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly already some design conditions uh, for the future and lessons learned uh, there. Um, Professor Kanna, um, in your profile, you highlight your interest in radical and transformative change also research-wise. So what makes a mission radical and transformative? Yeah, when, when we talk about transformative change in innovation economical terms, then it has to do rather with radical change compared to incremental change. Because we mean with that, that the current technologies in the system and the current behavior of the actors in the system have, has to change radically, have to, has to go in totally different directions as the directions they have uh, pursued before. And this, although each innovation has uncertainty, this radical change has a high degree of uncertainty, and nobody really knows what is the best solution. You only know that the current situation is not the one you want to, you want, you want to continue in. And therefore, so we talk about radical change. And now the mission, the mission is now a, 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 a connecting device between the, 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 the general uh, challenge you have and the R&D activities, the change activities you have to, in, have to induce. And the way how you define these missions and the way how you uh, agree on the missions have, has an, have a big in effect whether the transformation will take place in a proper way or not. I mean, let's talk about how to define a mission. I mean, you have various options. Of course, you can say we, we want to have mobility in 20 years, which is only battery driven. Now, that is a mission. Whether this is the best solution to the current situation in the end is not totally clear. I would say no. Therefore, it's, maybe it's better to define a mission in a way that you have more technological openness. You have more approaches which might be viable, and then they compete with each other, and then you see in the end which is the best solution or which is the combination of best solutions. But it does not have to be one solution. There could be several solutions which coexist. Why not? And therefore, the definition or the design of the mission, from my point of view, the most open definition, let's take the case of mobility, you want to have in 20 or 30 years, you want to have mobility CO2 free. 
You don't want to have the situation of today, which is CO2 ready. No, CO2 free. But what then happens is that a lot of actors try to, 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 to pursue this target. And some do it with batteries, and some do it with um, 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 uh, full cells, and some do it with synthetic, uh, synthetic um, uh, gasoline or something like this. Maybe some even try, I would not preclude that, to take the fossil engine systems and to improve them in a way and to take care of that in the end no CO2 will be exhausted. Maybe they, tr they, 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 they do that. Huh? So you have a lot of approaches which go into this direction, then you have a competition among these approaches, and then you have the, the combination or the, the winning solution in the end. But the uncertainty you, have, you are facing, you cope best if you have this te te technology open approach. And because then the actors who are knowledgeable in that try and experiment with ideas, and this experimentation then leads, hopefully, to a transformative change, which is, in the end, the one you would like to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. We're then, at the end of the day, probably still the question is whether the, the uh, mobility system can be changed through that, right? Yes. So, Okay. Rainer Walz, um, in the session, I think uh, there's one important topic that came also through the session that you were just involved in, uh, which is the question of research assessment um, and uh, the role that the, the way we look at research and science and how we evaluate it might play actually an important role uh, in terms of how missions are shaped. So maybe can you explain a little bit further about this? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Well, first of all, perhaps to, to make clear what my starting point is, basically, I can bring you clear two different perspectives. On the one hand, I have been talking a lot of sustainability is kind of piece, but on the other hand, I can also make a lot of that that's our own. The Institute being uh, evaluating some of our free service policies, but also accompanying these ideas like, like mission and reality deprivation policies. So, a little bit trying to combine these two perspectives. Uh, if you look at uh, missions and impact, uh, he is, of course, always gets the newly reach with missions, but what was the a contribution of the research uh, from Norway's mission target. However, that of course requires that we need to have somehow an idea of what the, the mission target really is, or we need to somehow uh, quantify the target that we can use as a benchmark. And that also makes a good question what is really the appropriate level of the mission. Uh, if it is too broad, like that has reached a sustainable development goal, number whatsoever, at seven, for example, I think that's too broad, so we have to bring it down to the appropriate level that we actually can uh, look at um, that is reached. For example, if we look at that mission with your heart or pocket. The high tax provision would really want to get seen that, that, that the level of information was very different from plastics to some like on the market. So I think that is one of the most important issues. It can only catch up with impact if you have some somehow like you're going about the benchmark. Now, the second, the we brought the business and evaluating that we thought of what we would want to be. The success of, of, of the research uh, sometimes uh, takes place only uh, quite a lot later than actually the research itself. Uh, so, uh, uh, have a real impact for reaching uh, SDGs, for example, that requires that they have upscaling and they have diffusion. Uh, and, and that's not taking place on the other So, if you look at right mobility, uh, it will take time to be able to use the definitions very potential. And now, in, in that, that process, a lot of other things are also taking place. Uh, beyond kind of the, the, the research results. If you look at uh, the availability of our uh, fuel cell, we were mentioning 
we also have, of course, to think about what is about the interest practice and, and uh, what, uh, what is about the positions uh, of the, to really invest into the different infrastructures. And there we have a it's not only a question of research policy, it's not a question of the total policy. We are thinking of some really important stuff of the government of, of missions that becomes clear again, because that also involves a lot uh, of uh, basic consideration that the research of the government, research ministry, is aligned with, for example, the ministry of transport, but that both sides are playing together. And you only can basically uh, come up with something like an extended impact assessment uh, of, of the research policy. If you have some question of what, what will be the sector policy, or will that link uh, be, be really uh, getting together? Uh, if, if you have research on a really very, very good new solutions that you've got to better research, got to electric uh, uh, cars. Uh, you also need for the real club of considering the real impact uh, of this research to need an idea what, what will be the definition, what will be the, the infrastructure. And, and that is, is the key challenge for the impact. So this impact we will come up with in the future, it will be the same kind of impact we have right now. We have the field evaluation, it will be more scenario that yeah, thank you. So maybe let's let's face this uh, core question of uh, where to start, because um, the mission needs a starting point. Obviously, it needs a, a vision, a goal, uh, something to focus on in terms of what is to be achieved there. And it was emphasized a couple of times that the process of doing so, including maybe questions of uh, ex ante assessments, etc. Uh, is a key question. Now, science obviously has a key role to play there uh, with a view to um, providing uh, evidence, perhaps, perhaps with a view to the uh, assessments uh, in various uh, uh, ways. So the normativity, of course, is also affected and influenced uh, by science. How would you suggest to start uh, mission design? What would be for you the, the entry point uh, in terms of the governance of mission design? It's an open question, not directed to anyone in specific, but whoever would like to pick it up, what would you be your starting point? Raise your I, no, I, mean, I, can't I can start. Yeah, please. I mean, the, the agreement on a mission we all want to pursue is not something which you can simply put on society top down. I mean, you have to have to have to talk to the to the society, to the economy, to the to the science, to the science uh, science people, and try to find out what could on, on which of these um, emissions could they agree on. And this is not a diff this is not an easy task, no no doubt, but top down will not work. Um, and therefore, I think this participation is one of the, of the major elements in order to, to come to these to these uh, to these missions. That's a, that's I think that's a starting point. From that on, then various measures uh, were already mentioned on the diffusion process, etc., etc. But this, I think, this is a starting point, and this is also the problem, I think, because it, the, the controversial discussion about mission is always in science freedom of research. Why do you tell me I should do this research? Now, therefore, you should not tell them; you should talk to them, and maybe you can convince them. In, an, in a discussion that these and these directions are the ones one should pursue and maybe other directions one should not pursue. Yeah. I think that's, 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 that's key. Yeah, so emphasizing participation clearly. Questions, of course, then maybe the one of responsibility of science yeah, versus or linked to freedom of science as was discussed also. Another. Well, I think um, there is no unique starting point. It depends very much uh, of your understanding of the mission, what type of a mission you have. Um, this morning we had the chance to discuss about different types of mission. Um, for instance, one type is a very uh, bottom-up approach, uh, ecosystem-driven innovation. 
and uh, I think this is a classical, it can only work with participation. If you don't have the actors which come together, uh, it certainly won't work. You cannot do that top down. On the other hand, and uh, that's the other end of the spectrum, um, where you have uh, overarching strategies, um, like it is uh, the case we have in Germany, uh, you have the necessity to have a political agreement between political actors of doing certain things, allowing certain things within a defined frame of time because uh, you need a milestone what you want, what you need to deliver in the four years parliament, uh, period of parliament. That doesn't mean that participation is useless, quite to the contrary. Uh, if you have such a starting point, it's even more important that you have participatory elements and uh, in the mission you have defined uh, and in the design of the mission, uh, you need to see very clearly um, in making that mission come alive, making it con concrete, uh, to have uh, a good scope uh, of participation. But I think uh, this then you need when you have the political agreement, and then you need to design how exactly can it be done best uh, for the goals to be, uh, achieve to work together with the actors um, in science, to work together with the actors in civil society, uh, to work together with the actors in the field of enterprises. And also, I think it's quite interesting um, to, to deal also with the so-called ordinary citizen. Um, we have a new instrument, uh, Bürgerrat, it was very much in discussion about the future for Europe. Uh, I think this is also something which can be very helpful um, in accompanying the Im implementation for missions. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that that I think, well, first of all, I don't think participation is just a something that everyone can engage in whenever they want to or need to. So I think one thing is that we need probably more and maybe different types of education so as to have citizens, for instance, or firms that are actually able to participate. Because it, I, I don't think democracy works just by everyone having a vote. It also needs to be somewhat that people are able to get the information they need on a level they can process in order to kind of get an idea of what it is we are talking about. And then I think if, if we manage to have better structure at that, then we can talk about participation. Because currently I think a lot of what we see is that, you know, it's, it's often a very shortcut to say, yeah, but we had an open day. We had, there was a possibility to send in a written statement. There was a consultation process, but not really taking it seriously that many people um, and actors more generally are not actually capable for whatever reason to meaningfully participate in this dialogue. So I think that's one thing to address before then completely um, subscribing to the idea that participation is, is important and especially maybe going a, a little bit against this idea of science as a as the truth um, that we see very much coming out of the US dialogue at the moment and I guess the COVID crisis has not helped with this and being a science technology scholar I'm very aware how difficult all of the more like you know right-wing populist ideas of there's different types of tr truth and uh, alternative truth and everything, that's really problematic. But on the other hand, to say, well, there's science and that's the truth and they have the answers and it's just listening, I think that's also really problematic. Um, and so to find you know, a middle ground between contributing to a scientific, with scientific evidence to a dialogue that then ultimately is a political one is different than steering it with a notion of we know where to go and how to get there. Yes, please. 
Er of course, the team knows the world for some time, and of dialogue, the team of the world is the world of impact and life of reason and science, but, but also on the, the other sides of the world, it's very important. We need a very broad world base. So we also have, I think, to increase the dialogue and participation in the research systems and to reflect on the possibilities and also to reflect about what does it mean if we take up the responsibility also of science for, for which what goes, what does it mean for the mind uh, that they need to reach. So I think that, that the second the second level, the third level then is actually next conclusion of, of, of research, the whole idea that the historical segments of the work of the internal and in the transdisciplinary mode and actually that is also nothing else and also having participation now by again with the uh, actors in the real world so to speak. Yeah, it may raise actually the question. There, there's uh, of course concepts about uh, online mass deliberation systems and things like that. So, do we actually have the the, the frameworks and the the fora uh, that could enable meaningful participation to to uh, come up with um, broader uh, orientations in terms of what different populations, different groups, different affected uh, groups would like to see emerge as a mission goal and therefore also as a as an initiative in terms of research. Do we have those forum? Um, I'm not so sure which forum really will work best in the end, but I think we have lots of opportunity to try out solutions. Uh, currently, we have a big experiment uh, running in Germany with the Year of Science, where we ask uh, citizens to put questions to science. So, in the first place, to engage citizens to get interested in science and to establish a direct relationship with science. But also, the uh, questions we have collected, they are uh, getting screened by a science panel. And the science panel looks uh, where are new ideas, new incentives, which we could use for new ideas, for new uh, um, aspects uh, we uh, didn't um, uh, consider perhaps enough, or which we can see now under a different, in a different light, under a different angel. Uh, angle. So I think uh, this is going to be interesting to see whether this endeavor we are having currently, which whether it is going to really help to create something new, or whether it's going just to reproduce uh, what we know anyway. But I think it's worth out to try and to see is how, how useful it is. And um, I don't think it's the only tool, the only way to try it. Um, but we are quite confident that it will be interesting because um, we are following a model which has been practiced already in the Netherlands. And in the ne Netherlands, um, it has given a good push, positive push for science. We can one point in yeah. addition. What to install in order to have a high participation? I mean, those actors who hope that they participate, they have the expectations of what will happen, how this change will take place. And transformative change is radical change. That means structures are completely uh, put in a different way. 
And you have to be aware that some of them, they, they, they feel they will lose. They expect that they will lose. And they, then they oppose. They oppose against everything, even, even uh, on, on, they oppose to scientific results. And they say, no, I, I don't believe that because they fear they will lose. Others will win. Of course, they participate. And I think um, a smart policy in this context has to take already early on care of um, telling that those who will be affected negatively will have some kind of compensation. And you have to do this before the change takes place. Um, and I think the policy is not really, as far as I see it, the policy as yet has not done this in the proper way. I mean, I mean you know the Lausitz region where the, where the um, uh, coal mining now got, got turned down. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure whether the policymakers really told them, yeah, we will compensate you. So they, they found out now we should compensate them. They do something. This is all okay. But if you have told them before, Say, okay, this is our plan. We do this and that and this. I think this would increase participation tremendously. Yeah. I would add to that that it's probably not only about economic compensation, but it's very much about being able to shape your own future and having some form of impact. And I think the type of, uh, it's really like human psychology that we're not very good with dealing with uncertainty and especially a loss of control. And if it becomes clear and everybody feels and also sees that whatever people are saying, whatever the media is writing, the only conclusion is that I'm going to be left out. And nobody is talking about a potential future, how that's going to be, and also not, nobody likes to have their future created for them in a kind of, no, but you know, you're going to like working in an IT firm instead. It's, that's, I don't think psychologically that's going to fly with, with any of us. So I think it's very much about building your own future and that means integrating people, maybe specifically the ones that will clearly lose um, or not lose. I actually think that sustainability, most people will profit because the ones that <laughs> really lose, they lose maybe their job, but maybe their job was in the first place not really the one to, to have, etc. So I also think this rhetoric about losing and winning in most sustainable visions, I think most people gain that currently have not much. But yeah, sure, you can maybe argue that, oh, we're going to take your car away. But they don't see that that might actually be a positive thing for all their health and their work environment and their family lives, etc. So I think there's a lot about, you know, having the possibility to imagine something else and being able to affect that personally that is important. I mean, I think the difficult issue, however, is that the strategy is that that might do very well for the disruption to be kind of foreseen and like the, the cold things down the path pretty easy to figure out that the fiction is not perhaps affected. But we also have to be aware of the transformations that that disruptive change of some of force also needs disrupting, which we are not able to see as time now. Even if we have the best part of master plan energy transition, we figure out that there are suddenly changes that regard to that. And I think in addition to these very specific ways and force B, we perhaps also do the broad relative um, uh, transformation. And basically that that already as well we know that there are uncertainties uh, uh, however we are you know, really take that uh, uncertainties that they show up to the consideration. And at the same time I think we need something like an institutional mapping of, of that process. So I think what is also very highly important is that the uh, integrated uh, aspect, just such as foresight, 
to visually tools to figure out what the disrupt teams very early on the integration uh, of how you have and basically we have to implement mixed idea from uh, integrating foresight much more strongly government policies, especially also with the thinking and foresight to do disruption. And I think that uh, this institutional uh, perspective uh, also gives place to what we talked to people in the air for that way. They had a little bit more of a life where very often you're coming, uh, but that gives you also a certain credibility that you really implement something in your, in your government governance process. That, that, that's key and important. In yeah. Thank you. I would like to open up uh, the question also to the floor, first of all here uh, in the room, but also online. Uh, I use the opportunity to encourage you to post your questions and our comments uh, in the chat, of course. Uh, and before we come to that, uh, I'd like to ask here in the audience if there are questions or comments. And please go ahead. We have a microphone here in place, so we can hand it over. Questions to the panel? Yeah, please, Roman Mendler. Microphone is coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm not quite sure how to start this, but basically what I'm interested in is um, the, the question of when do you have conflicts between things like mission targets and the way and how to get there. I think we've talked a lot about participation um, today in the city's mission case, for example, that's a very inherent part of the concept with cities being asked to create climate city contracts, which is in essence a, a wide scale stakeholder participation exercise that should lead to some form of written agreement, not only between city administration, but also wider groups of stakeholders, including citizens, for example. But you've also in the panel, many of you have um, discussed how uh, it's not always an easy task, right? This, this beautiful vision of once we get everyone together, the whole ecosystem is mobilized and then let's go. Um, and in case of the, the city's mission towards climate neutrality, you definitely have the sense of urgency to some extent. I mean, 2030, we always joke, is basically tomorrow. Um, we don't know if we're going to get there, um, even in the best of cases, even if we had everything sorted out. And there is a sense, even with the people that I work with and what I've heard from the cities of, we want to do both at the same time. We want to get to 2030, but we want to do it right. We want to do it with everyone. Now, my question is, and I'm assuming that we will have a reality check moment further down the line with this mission um, where we may find out that it's not always that easy. You might have to have to make hard choices once you're in that kind of process, maybe as a city, maybe as a service provider, who you name it, where you say, you know, we have to take cars away. I'm sorry, but it will have to happen. Or um, maybe certain things are not a question of you know, kind of like a deliberation process, but something of uh, action planning, um, investment planning, getting money from places where, yes, a big investor might, um, you know, be the one who is profiting from the investment that he makes rather than the actual city just to get that money to get to 2030. So my question is, how do you deal with these kind of conflict lines? Like, are there recipes for that, you know, or is there a, a wrong way of getting to the mission target or is there not because we're saying, you know, as long as we're climate neutral, we did enough. Like, these are the difficult questions that we face, I think, when we deal with the city's mission, at least. So I'd be happy for comments on that. Thank you for the question. Who would like to take that? Uber Gunner. I mean, um to expect that someone can set up a strategy to reach mission number A in a perfect and frictionless way, this is illusion, I would say. I mean, you have to set up a rough strategy. What are the principal elements you want to, to take into consideration in parallel and sequentially and so on and so forth. But then you have always to be ready to change the strategy because things which are not foreseeable uh, happen and you have to change your strategy. And this we have to make uh, totally clear. You have to communicate that in a very transparent way. Okay, now we have to do this, to do this and to do that. Therefore, this, this setting, uh, this following a strategy is also a little bit, from my point of view, is a little bit experimental. Uh, and this politicians have to go for. It's a difficult task. It's not simply putting some money in a tender and saying, now go and it, you will reach that. No, no. You have always to, 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 to be with them, to, to, to monitor them, to check, to evaluate what you have done. And this, I think, is the way how to, how to, to, to run such a, uh, such a strategy. An optimum, I'm optimal, I don't believe in optimal strategies. 
I would maybe add to to that that there's well, it's not about an optimal strategy for once, but also it's not about not making hard choices. So participation is not the same as consent. Democracy does not mean consent. It just means that every party is kind of informed about the different opinions and has ideally an understanding of where they're coming from, what they're arguing for, etc. Um, so that when the decision is made, it is pretty clear whose responsibility it is and who's accountable for that decision down the line also uh, in case there are issues. Um, and I think partly, I mean, governments have been very good at making all kinds of decisions all the time without asking anyone. And, and it, we run like that for most of our political life. And I think that has its purpose and it's, it needs to be done like that. But I think there's the insecurity that, that is, is very, I think, dominant in your question is that many of the people having to make the decisions are also insecure about them. So, you know, we're not at a point where you can say, well, that's left and right politics. I'm really convinced about that. So I put all my energy into this and I'm going there. It's very much like we know we need to change, but I think everyone that's a little bit thought through about their decision making knows that it's not not that straightforward. And so the accountability issue, if the one that needs to make the decision is equally uncertain as the ones that are governed by that, I think we have a bit of a, an issue. And I think that's what you mentioned with we need to be flexible. Governments need to be able to come back and say this was wrong. I'm sorry, retracting, try again, etc. And we're not very equipped with that either. So saying you're wrong as a politician is probably you know, political suicide. Um, but it should be, it should be what's really good. You know, it should be rewarded. It should be like, we try, we see and poke the system, let's see where it goes. If we see any signs that it goes in a direction none of us wanted, there should be something, you know, not 20 year programs. And if you then year two realize that was not ideal, then you're stuck. That's maybe we should get away from that. Well, I would fully agree what you, uh, both of you said, but I'm also not uh, convinced that by force it must be political suicide if you adapt um, something you had said before to uh, new insights, new developments. Uh, with the uh, speed of change we are having uh, this, I, I think it's quite the contrary. Uh, if you're not able to adapt to the new situation, uh, you will lose conf more confidence than uh, if you stick to something, an idea with which you started, but which doesn't fit anymore to the current situation. <laughs> So, uh, I think that's actually a key that's that to be honest in the first place that I've got to decide on you know, my beliefs that we really need to have to adapt to something because I might be this part of this cover that it is true, you know, it, it just uh, cannot force me. And of course, the point that the participation uh, uh, doesn't need to from, from sometimes making hard choices. Uh, and, and sometimes these hard choices also have to be made. That might be a little bit also in the public look at what people uh, mentioned earlier with the technology look at this. Because at that point, it is trying to uh, I think you know that uh, time you might decide are we going away there to invest in uh, only batteries uh, or are not in the way that the hydrogen infrastructure for cars because uh, it might be too costly to invest in those things. And of course, that involves that also very hard to see because you have uh, arguments and factories uh, on both sides would be the fake case, of course, for their people advantages. Uh, but, but that's the way of, uh, of uh, making political decisions. Uh, that's the way of uh, governments to work. That's, that's not different in the case of sustainability. Uh, perhaps that we be more honest with uh, the things you don't know and the possible future surprises might be bigger than other cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, with a view to the time, I would like to shift to the online questions and ask Markus Egermann, who has been monitoring the chat, to tell us what came up. 
Uh, yes, uh, thanks. And from our online audience, there's one uh, brave uh, contributor who asked the first question. It's from Nicola Schult Baumgart, and it's uh, posed to uh, you, Lea. But I guess uh, others can contribute as well. So uh, Nicola is very much agreeing on that we don't have a culture and don't have institutions uh, for quitting with things and uh, going out. And she asked, uh, or he asked, um, how can we start to establish such a culture or such institutions? Well, I think it goes hand in hand with what we discussed before, that it is very much about having the like, name also the ones that might be losing or however you that need to change the most or that have negative effects or that made investments for years that now turn out to be not being rewarded by society and once we have done that I think we can start thinking about how to address that but it's very hard to come up with institutions of how to quit before we have a little bit an idea of what the audience is like or who that actually um, concerns because I think it should then be very much dependent on are we talking you know firms are we talking economic losses are we talking people are we talking whole cultures are we talking nature animals the loss of you know all types of biodiversity we need to probably have a, a, a range of different aspects of, of or institutions that deal with that. Were there further questions or? Oh. Just, no? Okay. Well, then we will continue with questions from me. Okay, we, we need a microphone. Do Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, since we have three persons that in different capacity have been involved or looking at the high tech strategy, I was wondering whether after four years of operation of the strategy, do we have any lessons as to whether how far has the strategy gone in, term, in terms of supporting transformation and getting rid of past dependency? Do we have any lessons on that? So the free person was uh, you a can, uh, clear, clear question who would like to take it <laughs> okay yeah so thank you for the question high tech strategy 2025 um, i mean when the strategy was set up the first time we appreciated this this, this new approach uh, thinking long term thinking and transformational change all fine how it then was designed, there were good parts in it and there were parts which we criticized heavily, I have to confess. Sometimes these missions were so narrowly defined that I would not say they are missions that simply technology, pushing technologies. Okay, we made this point. Um, there, from our point of view, there is a construction problem in the high-tech strategy because it was set up by the BMBF, by the research ministry. But transformative change, innovations for transformative change, is something which relates to all ministries. This is not only the BMBF. And therefore, setting up such a strategy, maybe the next one will be done in this way, the Zukunft, uh, Zukunftsstrategy, that's in the next one, it has to be something which has to be drafted by all ministries. It's not only the BMBF, it's the, the economic, economic ministry, the environmental ministry of health, etc., etc. They all can be involved to different degrees because they have a common target, namely this transformation into. Uh, and I think that was, from my point of view, or of, of, of from the EFI Commission, that was a construction problem at that point. And, but now you can cure that with a new strategy and then we will see whether it works better. I'm optimistic, but I'm not certain. Uh, um, actually, uh, in person, I was not, uh, I was not in place when uh, the high-tech strategy was formulated. So I could take a very relaxed look at what you just said. Uh, but um, at least in my perception, from what I know about the designing pro uh, process, um, it's not true to say it was um, only a BMBF strategy. Uh, of course, uh, in politics, it's also always, if you have a leading ministry, the visibility in the media uh, and also the political credit uh, goes mainly to the ministry which is in the lead. 
but uh, before the strategy, uh, which was not finalized by the ministry, but which went to the cabinet, there had been very intensive discussions with the different ministries. Uh, so I think, I don't think it's uh, the point, the other ministries were not involved, but uh, I think it was rather the other point you also met already, the question, how do we design a strategy? And, um, I think um, we, uh, the process as such was okay, but we uh, were too less knowledgeable on how to formulate it that the strategy afterwards will work. I think that, that was the primary weakness. I think there is another point, which has not only one strategy, but I had strategy. Uh, I look at the sustainability issue. Uh, we have no other in itself has a certain dialogue on to with some mission kind of um, uh, and then we have also the debate and uh, 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 and, and uh, a governmental uh, dialogue about uh, transformation for example in like, the flight of policy uh, where you have the, the, the sectoral targets in Germany and that would be flying into the cabinet uh, of the whole process of the line policy actions that have been here to be had uh, was, was somehow something, but it was not really as, as a long uh, sectoral policy industry, it was not in the core of that policy. And so I think the key issue is that we have to collect them and also we have these different uh, policy process uh, much more longer than ever. Uh, so we need not want to try that the uh, policies uh, uh, the situation is changing a little bit more than with the new uh, ministry that we have a double uh, pay like uh, what about climate and we have to see how far it will have to take some. But I think if this issue of uh, inter-department uh, group uh, discourse uh, and also basically uh, not only on the left on the right side, there is on the division leaders, uh, but actually having one kind of discourse also, uh, and that the people uh, who run with the same problems will be going forward, uh, uh, and there is this improvement that uh, area, but, but there's also some additional Okay, I think uh, we could take a final question only if it is a short one and only if the answers are short, but I would allow that. Katharina Helming. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think the issue of cross-sectoral integration we also will address tomorrow at the panel, but my question uh, goes back also to the identification of the mission the, and the role of participation. And here I would like to bring in the notion of transparency. You mentioned the boundaries in which you have to act. You mentioned also the, uh, I mean, you have to deliver someone. You have uh, your four years rotations. How transparent can you be about the decisions you take at the end and the boundaries you have when you deal with the participation and involve people in the definition of the missions? Short question. Yes, who, who would like to, to respond? doesn't have to be everybody. Well, uh, if you want a short answer, um, one has to say it's, it's just, a, a, there's no simple answer. It's a trade-off. Um, you need, if you need to advance in a certain time frame, uh, you have to move forward. So that means you cannot discuss with everyone, uh, but you have to have instruments to take everyone on board on the way. And um, I think uh, it's still possible to take decision and then to have a transparent process. Other answers, Leo? Maybe also make sure that there are very clear um, or protocols over who disagreed with the final result that is then being chosen so that people feel like they were heard so it's not like they were just ignored, but it's rather that that was a deliberate decision 
to then say like, no, but we decided to go another way. But that it's still possible to, to see who and through yeah, which reasons they had to oppose this. And I think this is kind of the key to having a working democracy, that, that you don't always get your way, but you kind of know that people know that you were against and you were for and you, and the legitimacy also comes from different actors. So I think it's important to, to know who's for and against and why. Uvekanda? I think everything is said, but I can, I can contribute to that. It's also a matter of communication. We currently have a Minister of Economic Affairs who clearly explains why he decided that and that and that. I mean, in a crisis situation, maybe that's easier. But this kind of communication, we need much more. And that's, this, I think, for me, that's transparency. And then you can even sell critical decisions. Say, I have to do it this way because one, two points. Huh? Nevertheless, we also have to be aware that uh, sometimes in Yeah, let me thank you, uh, my, my guests, participants here today, uh, Rainer Walz, uh, online, Dietrich Nelle, Lea von Schilling, Uwe Kantner. Great many thanks. I think it was a very interesting and intriguing debate. We have certainly recognized that missions are no simple projects. They are rather complex processes uh, that are very demanding because they are searching processes, essentially, and they require uh, rules in terms of how do you deliberate, how do you create legitimacy, how do you deal with uncertainty, how do you deal with transparency, so many of these crucial conditions that uh, we have not yet fully figured out, but we are on the way, I guess, and uh, some ideas are around. Also at this table, so thanks for that, and we'll look into uh, further questions of implementation also tomorrow uh, in the panel discussions where issues of governance, etc., will be more concretely dealt with.